Welcome back to our live stream session with Matt Gru. Uh, today we have a special guest again, um, Jason Davis, distinguished engineer at Cisco. So it's really a pleasure to have you, Jason. Thank you so much for joining our stream. Yeah, um, to great to have you. And uh, you know, if you could please introduce yourself to us, a couple of words about you and, and what you do at Cisco. Yeah. So, so I'm a distinguished engineer. I'm uh, based out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. So I work at Cisco's second largest campus, and I'm in the the same developer relations team that you are. So it's great to have an opportunity to you know pal around with you, um, see you at events and such. Um, it, within developer relations, I uh, lead special projects and. Uh, and do a lot with our uh, technical consulting. And so um, some other projects like working uh, with the Cisco Live Knock, do a lot of public speaking, uh, at third party events, uh, in addition to, to Cisco Live. Um, and actually I'm gonna get to speak at the inaugural AutoCon Zero uh, event for the Network Automation Forum, NAF, which will be in, um, it's gonna be in, uh, November 13th and 14th in Denver. So I'll share some nice. more on social media about that. Nice, nice, nice. And where can people find you on socials? On socials, um, I'm SNMP guy on Twitter. Uh, so I've been in X. network <laughs> X. I've been in network management and automation for many years. So SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, was an area that I. Uh, specialized in for many years. So SNMP guy is my uh, Twitter X handle. Um, it's also my license plate. If you're ever in Raleigh and see a Chevy Avalanche driving around with a SNMP guy, you can say hi. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn as Jason C. Davis. Um, I'm also in GitHub. Um, so it's Jason C. Davis. So. Cool, cool, cool. So you were saying about Cisco Live. I mean, you've been building infrastructure for this event for many years now. Um, and I mean, I've always been curious, you know, how you set up an event like this, because I mean, the events are huge and you have just, you know, a week, maybe at best mm -hmm. to bring up all these huge venues for, for events like Cisco Live. So there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes just to make everything work, to bring the network there, to make sure that people have internet connection and they're safe and the cyber attacks and all of that. So if you don't mind showing us a bit, because um, I guess uh, you're super experienced at this, yeah. if you could show us, you know, part of the, the, the event that maybe most of the people don't see, and like a look behind the curtains at uh, what's happening at events like Cisco Live and how the infrastructure comes to life and you know how the team builds it. Certainly. Um, so yeah, Cisco Live, uh, hopefully you've been there. If not, uh, this is just a quick overview, heavy on the pictures. So it's not gonna be a training <laughs> slide deck for you, but I thought folks might like to see what's going on behind the scenes, but we've been doing Cisco Live. It used to be called Networkers all the way back to 1989. Um, I've been involved in the Network Operations Center in the setup and monitoring of the show uh, for the last 15 years. Um, before that, there was actually a company called ShowNets that would handle the network IT. Uh, and if, if you think about it, a company might be having some kind of conference. They may not be in the same business as we are at Cisco um, and you know, showing off the wireless and the, uh, the routers and switches that make up the, the venue. But since we are doing Cisco Live and this is our equipment, generally we decided about 15 years ago, hey, let's, let's set it up ourselves. Let's monitor it ourselves and show it off. Um, and we do it in the US and Europe. It used to be, um, also in, in many other places. We, we still do um, one in Australia, um, in Melbourne, and um, we just uh, finished Las Vegas this summer in, in June. We also have uh, the same group of people and somewhat same equipment being used for internal conferences like our Impact Conference, which is for our sales team to celebrate 
their success over the year and also get some training. It's it's kind of like a mini Cisco Live, but it's just Cisco people and mostly our salespeople. Um, and there's also a partner showcase and a few other large events that it just makes sense for us to have uh, an event team. And that event team is called TechX for Technology Experience. It's actually very small, like 16 to 20 people. And that's their job is to go around maybe two dozen events uh, through the year. And they rely on um, volunteer subject matter experts like myself to help them. And um, the developer relations leadership has been uh, very gracious to say, hey, we'd love for Jason to, to help you guys. It shows the capability and uh, what happens when you use APIs. And, and focus on network programmability. So it's it's a good thing for us to to be involved in. Um, as I plus, mentioned, I mean, go ahead. Plus what, what you learn right there, you can then present and showcase to the developer relations community, to our demo community. So it's a win-win for pretty much everyone. So the, the, the developer relations community also are our own product teams, if you think about it, we're bringing in products from across our portfolio. And this is the opportunity for me to act like a customer for, you know, a few weeks. And we have to do it much more quickly than a typical customer would. <laughs> um, and it comes down very quickly. But um, for for the two weeks of a Cisco Live, uh, we're very much acting like a customer. We're, we're setting up connecting to an internet service provider, either at the venue or one that we've contracted with. Um, and we hook it up, right? <laughs> so a couple million access or a couple million square feet n needs, you know, a couple thousand wireless access points mm -hmm. to cover it, right? So you're seeing pictures of the FIRA uh, in Barcelona, the San Diego Convention Center, Las Vegas, we've been doing uh, for the last several years. Uh, Mandalay Bay, the adjacent conference center of Mandalay Bay uh, for impact that we were just at for our sales conference. We also extended out to the MGM uh, facility and uh, had a, a Cisco network that was sharing the same wireless across multiple buildings. Um, yeah, so it's really cool to get to do it in the U.S. and Europe. So, um, so some numbers, you know. We're geeks. We like some of the, the techie stuff behind the scenes. Um, at its peak, we had 28,000 attendees. Um, obviously, we had a couple years off. We're starting to see now the last couple years that we're, we're having in-person events again. And uh, uh, we were up to um, about 22,000 attendees for Cisco Live this summer. So hopefully as... Um, things continue to progress. We'll uh, we'll have even more. But at its peak, we had 28,000 attendees, about 74,000 mobile devices, and this was 2019 in San Diego um, that I captured these max numbers at. Um, but normally, for an event in the United States, we're deploying you know close to 650 network switches. Uh, we have a core distribution going to the different wiring closets. We we use the 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 venue's wiring, but we try not to use their equipment. Sometimes their equipment might be old. Few cases, they may actually not be using Cisco equipment. So <laughs> in those situations, for us to go in and drop in a new core data center and to go to all the wiring closets and put in, you know, 9,000 series uh, switches, um, if they've got reasonable wireless access points, by reasonable, I mean like 37s or 3,800s or 48 hundreds. If they're that old, we'll use them. We'll just swing over their access points to our uh, wireless LAN controllers. Um, and then sometimes we see venues that are staying pretty close to latest capability, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and the 9000 series APs. So um, so that's good. Sometimes you'll go to an event, you might see um, aluminum poles hanging out somewhere in the hallways and there'll be an access point on that on that pole. And that usually indicates that in that area, when we did our site survey, we determined that we needed to fill in, you know, a little bit more. Um, so, uh, you know, 2,300 wireless access points, 
not all the time do we need to deploy them. Sometimes, again, we're assuming the management of the venues wireless, but a few times we do need to fill in um, where we like to have a more seamless experience, like uh, an escalator or something like that. Hey, we need to put an access point over on this escalator so somebody going between floors will stay on the network without drops. Um, and, and you'll see those set up on temporary poles and such. Um, we bring in uh, a mobile containerized data center. This is not a Docker container. This is a shipping container. So a 24 foot shipping container. It's got um, plexiglass window on one side and then a hard cover that flips over to shield it when it's actually being shipped. But in there, um, a few racks of um, equipment, that's the whole show. And, you know, yellow cable coming up off of that thing is the fiber connecting us to the internet um, for Cisco Live Las Vegas and Impact. We had three 100 gig primary links and two 10 gig backup links. So 320 gig of internet capacity, which is quite a bit of pipe. Um, yeah. Hopefully using all five of those connections at the same time. <laughs> We, they're all lit up. The, the maybe not much traffic going through them. Um, we, you know, it, the traffic will tend to prefer where it's heading to. So, uh, Las Vegas in the last couple of years got its own hundred gig pop. Lumen is our um, provider for uh, Cisco Live in the U.S. And if we're in um, Las Vegas, we're using Lumen to Denver, Sunnyvale, California, and Las Vegas. If we're over in Orlando then it's still Denver and Sunnyvale, but the Las Vegas pop will be something else closer to Orlando, possibly Atlanta, whatever. Mm. So um, so we do get a, a nice relationship with high-speed connectivity. We've been uh, thinking about trying to get dual 400 gig links, but supply chain being what it is, uh, we may not see dual 400 until next summer maybe after, but I'm looking forward to it. Even if we only use 1% of that, you know, it's just, it's really fun to be able to do a, a speed test. And I have to go in there with a multi gig dongle on my Mac just to like, you know, prove that I can get something better than what wireless can, can provide um, as a switched connection into the core. Um, yeah. So that's all, you know, the, the ASR 1009 X's are the connection to the Colo. Um, uh, Catalyst 6800 core switch, uh, or dual um, in a pair. Um, then uh, we've got our uh, our fire um, firepower firewalls and clusters. Um, we're doing 100 gig links between all these. Um, we've got our UCS and Hyperflex systems in there, along with NetApp storage. And the NetApp guys are great, giving us way more storage and then what we need and all flash um, storage arrays. So it's just, it, it, it really is a technology showcase. We're not um, putting a stress on it. It's <laughs> it's to show off technology, um, but it's cool. And then as you see in here, um, we also tend to set up a video display wall to show off the stats of, uh, of the event. Um, and I mentioned how we're using pretty thick pipes to, to get there. Um, Moving up to carrier grade kind of connectivity, the 100 gig kind of thing, really in the last few years caused us to think a little bit differently about what are the nuanced things that we need to monitor as we go up into 100 gig. So optical transceiver power levels and, you know, the laser transmit receive power levels. Uh, those are things that we didn't really need to think about too much when we were at 1 and 10 gig. But as we stepped up into higher optics, we're like, yeah, we should really be measuring, you know, the, the strength of that optical signal. And so you'll see some dashboards that are kind of unique in that regard that um, we're gathering some of that. So we have the opportunity to look at what kind of telemetry and instrumentation is available to us. You know, having mm -hmm. SNMP guy as my uh, Twitter handle or X handle in my license plate, uh, you know, yeah. SNMP MIBS been about that for many years, but you know over the last six seven years been really getting into Yang models and NetConf, GRPC streaming telemetry, and we have the ability with our 
you know, ASR 1000s to, you know, push at us every 10 seconds. Here's the interface um, metrics. And we also gather routing table metrics. Um, and we learned, you know, over the years, there are some things that are important to monitor, some things that are not as important to monitor. And uh, I'll tell you uh, just very transparently, um, eight years ago, we had a, an issue where an upstream provider not Lumen, but <laughs> an upstream provider essentially knocked Cisco Live off the internet and we lost our routing table. So we start monitoring the size of our routing table, right? And uh, we want we want to see it, you know, we accept three or three or four percent variance either way. You know, more networks come on, some go away. But if we start to see a drop five, 10, 15 percent, okay. We need to call Lumen and say, hey, is there something going on upstream from us because we're starting to lose, you know, our connectivity um, from our peers. And uh, that's good that we're monitoring metrics like that. And obviously take advantage of a lot of our um, newer technology, some developed and some acquired um, like Thousand Eyes, right? Well, we set up uh, Intel Nooks and Raspberry Pi 4s and um, Python, or not Python, um, uh, Ubuntu uh, Linux virtual machines running the the Thousand Eyes package, and then we can have a very diverse uh, way of gathering availability, latency, packet loss measurement. Um, we've coupled that with, in a unique sense, with our Umbrella and Open DNS service. So as we monitor what sites people are actually going to, we feed that programmatically into um, our thousand eyes monitoring, you know, years ago, we would just say, Hey, here's two dozen websites. We think people are going to go to, right. Cisco.com, mm -hmm. Cisco live.com developer.cisco.com, uh, you know, various AWS endpoints, ESPN, and, you know, Apple would invariably do something during our Cisco live event with some new product launch or whatever. So we would, we would monitor Apple's website and all the various, you know, Hey, it's patch Tuesday for Microsoft, right? So we would monitor a lot of different um, sites like that, but we were assuming these were the sites that people were going to. When we started to couple the actual parsing of the DNS lookups that people were doing on site and using that as a, a stacked rank way to say, hey, these are the top 100 sites that people are going to just by DNS lookups, right? We're capturing all the um, all the DNS lookups and caching it. Okay, cool. So let's add, you know, UPC to the to the table that we're looking for availability, latency, and packet loss monitoring because for some reason a lot of people are going to UPC, um, you know. You, uh, for UPS, <laughs> maybe they're going to sale or something like that. Um, so that there's fun things like that going on um, behind the scenes that you may not see. Cool. And do you actually get a BGPS number with this mobile data center you're saying? Or yep, you just... we, we have a, a, a pretty big block of public address space, V4, nice. V6. And, uh, and we also, you know, heavily NAT things to uh, protect our our customers and, and attendees, um, but we also expose quite a bit of services. Um, sometimes we need to take in webhook information. Um, sometimes we're doing things with collaboration technology that requires us to, you know, have a more permanent address exposed. Um, but here's some pictures of what it looks like behind the scenes. Um, starts with a blank canvas. If you've never been in a, a convention hall before, it's just concrete floor, right? And within a few days, we're laying down booths. They're they're setting up signage and a lot of cherry pickers and and forklifts and and things like that running around. You got to be careful. Sometimes we wear safety vests because there's so much equipment running in and out of the conference center behind the scenes. Um, get the lights and the um, aluminum strut holding up the lights and and LED curtains and drapes and whatever. Right, everything that goes up has to get sent up. Right. And uh, so we go into a blank canvas. That's why we bring in this um, mobilized, uh, mobile containerized data center. So what you're seeing on the left there was a few years back before we turned it into a shipping container and has integrated network power, cooling and all that. Um, so we used to just have the racks individually and then 
set them up next to each other. Right. Um, and then we'd, you know, run cables between them. And, and we worked with a, a, a partner to have like mass um, fiber connectors now. So now we can just snap the um, connectivity across racks together without having to like really trace things down into a, a rack level. And, and we can pull racks out when we need to for maintenance and such. Um, we end up going back behind the, the venue and to their own colos, uh, their connectivities. A lot of these venues have, you know, relationships with the existing service provider in the area and, and have drops there. So we have to wire to that uh, connectivity. So sometimes you see a big yellow cable coming up off of our container, a shipping container with our equipment, and it's being kind of st strapped along the ceiling. Um, it's to get over to whatever that wiring closet is that gets us down into uh, the colo facility. And if somebody were to, you know, I don't know, launch some drone with some lawn cutting kind of blades, then yeah, boom, that's the whole show right there, right? It's the registration. It's it's the um, a testing center it's, and everything kind of runs back to our, our little container there. And what you're seeing on the lower right-hand corner, sometimes we need to get connectivity to an adjacent building. Like uh, that was San Diego and we needed to get connectivity over to the Hilton, I think. Is it either the Hilton or the Hyatt? But one of them next to the conference center, for whatever reason, did not already have existing fiber between the event center and the, the hotel. So we decided to shoot a, a one gig uh, cannon beam over um, to a, a room that was at that hotel that had a, a balcony. And then we were able to, you know, take the, the gig link into that um, hotel and extend our Cisco Live Network into that hotel. I think they were doing Whisper Suites or something like that. So mm. a lot of fun, fun things. And, you know, occasionally um, you need to get a little bit uncomfortable um, so get up on a lift or something to, you know, retarget uh, an antenna uh, for an access point. So uh, th that was a picture of someone somewhere in Europe uh, where they had uh, like these wires that would run up there and you had to like wear a harness and strap in and, and link into a, a overhead set of wiring. So if you fell off the, the beam, it would at least catch you. Um, <laughs> it's almost like zip lining at that point. Over zip there. lining. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, ZTP. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, we tend to build our network pretty modularly. Um, you know, we, we have connectivity, other buildings. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to monitor things really succinctly. Also, there's a data center block. So there's, you know, the internet connectivity, firewall, core, another set of firewalls, and then the data center block. So, so we protect the whole show with firepower firewalls, you know, um, from the internet, but we also have another set in front of our data center block. So if there's anybody inside the event that's trying to do something a bit snarky, then uh, we have um, that ability to, you know, provide a layer defense. Um, yeah, and being very modular and hierarchical just gives us strong ability to repeatedly configure things in a templatized way, and then also monitor it <laughs> in a very templatized way too. But to your point earlier, we don't have a lot of time on site. They give us four or five days before the event starts to show up. Um, for some people, you got a you know, little bit of time zone change there you got to think about. Um, and then boom, you just start hitting it hard, getting the equipment built up from the core and the da data center that we drop, and then out into the wiring closets, out to the various uh, breakout rooms, hooking up the the little cat 3560 CG switches, the 10 port fanless POE capable switches that we use for um, connecting access points up in the strut, out in the hallways for digital signage, in the breakout rooms for uh, the speaker computers and for the session capture equipment. Uh, so there's a lot going on there. Um, we have to pay attention because it is a live work area. People driving over things with lifts and Oh, boom, this thing went down. Okay, well, what happened? We go out there and find a cable got cut because somebody drove over it with a forklift or, you know, whatever. And it's happened to equipment too, where you get a switch that was left out too close to a, a um, an aisle, an aisleway, and a forklift driver wasn't paying too attention to where he was rolling and 
he pringled one of our switches so <laughs> driving over it um yeah i mean this this four or five days are it's pretty intense right if you have to deploy 2000 plus access points mm -hmm. besides your just your mobile data center switches. yeah yeah i mean that's a lot of intense work those those days right before the event right mm -hmm. Yeah, and a little bit of pre and, and some pre staging before in, in uh, uh, Building 17, um, Cisco's campus in San Jose. So if you go into that building, it kind of looks like uh, Home Depot for Cisco. It's just racks of switches and access points. And hey, we've got this event. We need X number of this type of equipment, Y number of that type of equipment. Just start picking it off of storage um, shelving and uh, sometimes provisioning it there, sometimes just putting it in shipping containers and then sending it on site and then doing what needs to be provisioned on site. So, uh, we have some metrics that obviously we're concerned about, you know, typical CPU memory interface errors and things of that nature. I mentioned routing table monitoring that um, because we on make sure we didn't lose our adjacencies with the internet. Um, with all the latest wireless, innovations, including Wi-Fi 6 and 6E. We've been really getting into some cool telemetry and instrumentation monitoring on the wireless side. Um, and some of that innovation happens with us at Cisco Live that then gets fed into our product teams. Um, I mentioned Wi-Fi 6. So mm -hmm. think about what happened in 2019. Wi-Fi 6 was ratified, right? But then the world blew up with COVID. And there were no large events going on because people weren't getting together in person. So that didn't mean that Wi-Fi 6 stopped, right? People were still upgrading phones and tablets and laptops. They may not have been upgrading their office environments or the conference venues or the schools and universities. Some people did take that opportunity when there were no people in offices to do the upgrades, but some did not. So there wasn't a lot of innovation going on in the monitoring of Wi-Fi 6, and then 6E followed it really quickly. So when we got back into the swing of things with um, Cisco Live Amsterdam um, uh, earlier this year, we're like, okay, we need to really like figure out what's the state of the art. What what can we do with the telemetry and instrumentation available to us? So you're starting to see some really cool dashboards coming out of our team. And we'll eventually, the same logic and visualizations will be going into our commercial products um, as they uh, start to ad adopt some of that too. So, um, and here's, you know, some rep representations of... Um, some of the dashboards, it may be a little hard to see, but uh, we want to just throw them all up. There are quite a few of them. Um, you know, we've got a three-pronged strategy. It's, you know, use the commercial tools, right? We got to support our, our own business. Um, where we see opportunity, um, augment that with open source. And so when I use the open source solutions, then I am able to focus my energies on what is the telemetry and instrumentation that's available out there. Can I get it through SNMP, through uh, NetConf RPCs and Yang models, GRPC, streaming telemetry? Do I need to go all the way back to command line driven stuff? I call that finger defined networking or FDN, right? And that's the basis of uh, the SSH to influx thing that we're going to show off here in a little bit. Um, and then uh, beyond open source, there's just like homegrown. So the top row of four dashboards there, those are all, you know, special ones that we collected the data and then we transformed the data and then we displayed the data using some basic HTML um, capabilities, right? But the ones that you see are, you know, gauges and time series data. Some of those are like Grafana dashboards because we don't want to get into like building widgets that are, you know, time series and and gauges. We, we'd rather spend our time looking at what's the cool data. Can we mash it up from multiple sources and glean new insights out of it? And then let someone else like Grafana, who has the, the wonderful ability to render things, let them, you know, do their magic. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we, you know, show off, people may recognize the Jerry Lewis telethon dashboard. This is showing how many ter terabytes of traffic we move with the event. Uh, 
since we open registration, um, we invariably have people um, that uh, I'll, I'll throw out Nicole <laughs> that loves IPv6 stats. So, uh, you know, what's going on with the ratio of IPv6? So this summer we started seeing a 50-50 split between IPv4 and IPv6. But wow. ago, it was only in the tens or 20%. So, so we made some big movements in the last couple of years with uh, IPv6 traffic. Um, we have to think also about our audience beyond just the technical ones uh, that are there. Sometimes we have people that are non-technical or they're new in career, um, maybe they're managerial, who knows, but um, they may ask the question, well, what is a terabyte and what does that mean? So we kind of thought, let's build a dashboard that shows traffic volume, but in comparison to other physical things that we're familiar with, you know, CD ROMs, DVD ROMs, um, how many libraries of Congress, uh, going all the way back to Greybeard punch cards, uh, just to, <laughs> to kind of enjoy that aspect, had to research that. I was like, how much data could you put on a punch card? Um, and then have to explain what a punch card was. Um, <laughs> And my kids were like, Dad, how many movies would that have been in the Marvel movie series? So we thought about how many movies were in that series at the time and how much data would be taken up if you took a Marvel, a two and a half hour Marvel movie and encoded it into an MP4. Um, so, you know, 67 terabytes was equal to 2200 copies of all the Marvel movies at the time. So that would have been a lot of, you know, pirating of videos if that's what we were doing. But we weren't. Um, we were actually, you know, making sure that people were not pirating movies, but they, they take advantage of having, you know, yeah, 300 gig of internet pipe. So I'm sure they do. Yeah. Or they try to, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, as we're doing automation, things are like, we want to measure what, how much time did something take us manually? And then when we automate it, compare it with the runtime with the automation and then provide a dashboard that would show a return on investment and use of, of um, automation. So how much time are we saving? And, and you know, as you collect information, sometimes you find interesting things that happen. So if you take, you know, 400 switches and you overlay memory and CPU on the same dashboard, if they're all performing a similar function, they, ha they should have a similar amount of memory and CPU consumption. And we found a, a, a switch that was out there that was having this really slow memory leak, right? And because we were collecting it, we could make a decision, well, how fast is the memory leak? Oh, well, it's taking, you know, about 10%, you know, every 12 hours. So like, okay, well, we could actually get by through the rest of the event for another three or four days until we actually get into a, an alarming point of memory consumption. So we don't necessarily have to take this out of service or do a therapeutic reboot or you know anything like that. So, um, so this is a good opportunity, um, but you have to collect the data in order to, to make those decisions, right? Um, yeah, there's some new, I was mentioning the new wireless dashboard. So this one's a really cool new one that's using just the native telemetry inside the wireless LAN controller to show per access point client count. So how many wireless clients are on each AP and each of these little practically at a pixel level, <laughs> each of these is an access point and the color as it gets like um, more closer to red is the higher count. So if it's darker blue or black, it's a lower count account. And if it gets yellow and red, that means it's a higher count. Transmit utilization. So how much data are we pushing from the access point down to the wireless clients? Receive utilization. How much traffic are we getting from, from the clients into the AP? And then over overall channel utilization, right? So how are we doing with the, the frequency um, adjacencies with other access points? Um, we could see certain events happening. Okay. Breakfast, people are coming in. Now it's starting to get a little bit warmer in the shoreline meal area, right? Uh, oh, okay, now people have left breakfast. They've started moving into the ballrooms in the first sessions of the day. And then uh, when attendees were moving between sessions, the hallways would start to get pretty warm on the access points. You know, people still have their devices synchronized. Um, there was this one set of ballrooms that we saw pretty much red across that. And we were like, what's going on in that ballroom? It turned out that room was being used for tablet charging. So people, the, the 
people that would check you into the rooms were using tablets to scan people and they would take their tablets to this one room and recharge, but they're all still associating to the access point. So that room was getting like hundreds of tablets and it was like, oh, that, okay, we understand. So no big deal. Um, and then we look at like the keynote, number of people coming into the keynote, right? Okay, boom, everybody comes in. What do they do? They start to um, do a speed test immediately, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, then, so then the download, you know, it comes in pretty hot, right? And then what do they do after the, you know, they've done their speed test and they've checked social media and everything. They they sit down for a little bit and then they're watching and then Chuck comes up or some performer or keynote uh, guest, you know, and they're taking pictures and then they're uploading, you know, so then you're seeing the spikes of people uploading their pictures, you know, in the keynote area and then then the keynote ends and then the area turns cold again. So some really cool channel, um, utilization heat maps, uh, things we just developed in the last year um, and, and allows us to make, you know, good decisions about what's going on with the event. Um, but to do this, it's about APIs. Yes. And more than that. Yes. You got to show <laughs> us SSH to, to, to Influx? Yes. Yes. Um, so what SSH to Influx is about, um, I've got this project. And uh, yes, we're doing streaming telemetry. We're doing um, NetConf RPC polling, kind of like SNMP. We're not doing much SNMP anymore, except for what the commercial tools do. The, the things that I develop actually have no SNMP <laughs> uh, because I've been able to do everything with streaming telemetry uh, receipts and subscriptions and uh, NetConf RPC polling, uh, no SNMP. Unfortunately, however, there is still stuff that's out there on the command line interface, right? Some various show command could be arguments, seven, seven arguments deep, could be some ASIC register or something that just will never find the time of day in, um, in a, uh, uh, a MIB or in a Yang model, but we need to gather it through a CLI means. So I created this project called SSH to Influx. It automates the, um, the connection to a device you define inside of a YAML file. So you don't need to actually do any Python programming. You go into this YAML file and you say, here are the devices in the inventory that I want to talk to. And what I'm showing here is the sandbox DevNet DevRel environment. So, um, the devices that you're going to connect to, what are the commands that you're going to run? So the I can have device-specific commands and I can have group commands. And then what is the parsing specification? And I call it a parse spec. Parsing specification defines the regular expression match that you're going to do of that output. And then how do you want to tag it? And this is where the influx part comes in. So there's capturing groups out of that output, right? I wanna capture a host name, I wanna capture, in this case, we're doing a show version. And in this, I wanted to capture the host name and the uptime is so many days, hours, and minutes, right? And I wanna throw that into Influx and I wanna tag it, right? So when I, the first capturing group is the host name, right? Host mm -hmm. name, block. second capturing group is essentially how many minutes, hours, you know, and days it's been up, right? So I can have that for different operating systems. So like for this NXOS device, it has a different output in its show version, which means the parsing specification needs to be a different one. So I've got a second parsing specification here. And when I run this, um, it'll uh, go pretty quickly. Actually, when I first did it um, last year, I did not have it in a, um, a very efficient way. It was pretty much, here's a list of devices, go through it one by one. Uh, 200 devices took 15 minutes, right, to, to mm. get through. And that was quite a long time. Um, I rewrote it this summer to use Python threading and uh, thread pool executor. And now it, I did the same 200 devices and it took 90 seconds. I went from 15 minutes down to 90 seconds. If you think about it, there's a lot of waiting going on here, right? There's login. Did I get a prompt? Did I authenticate? 
Did I get a prompt again? Now I run the command, wait for the command to finish. Did I get the prompt, right? So there's a lot of waiting going on in, um, it, it, when you're talking to a device. While it's waiting, it could go talk to another device with another thread, right? So that's the idea around using SSH to influx with its new threading capabilities. Um, I can have hundreds of devices, thousands of devices defined, and I set up this YAML file saying this command, this pattern is what I want to match, and here's how I want to tag it. So when it goes into influx, then I can pull it out with Grafana and then show it however I want to. Um, let me kind of tee this up with, I, I do have a test dashboard right now. Dashboard has nothing in it because there's no data behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So this, this dashboard is going to show three devices and their uptime. Okay, that's cool. Let's run that. So now I'm going to run um, my Python script. Um, a P, this dash P option is just what is that YAML file? What is the project file or parameter file that I'm going to use that says what the inventory is, what are the commands, pattern, the spec, yeah. the par spec, all that stuff. So I'm going to run yeah. it here. Boom. It's running it. Now I'm just running it one thread. Okay. So it's, it's going in, it's learning the device prompts. Now it's talking to the device, getting the command output. Boom, boom, boom. And okay, one device that didn't respond, that's okay. At least we're taking care of it. And aha, got to run it again. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to go back, take a screen snapshot of my error here so um, I can make sure I capture that exception next time. Anyway, it's running again. Now we're, we've talked to all four devices. We've captured the command to all four devices. There we go. And then we're going to create the influx uh, line protocol output. Boom. Mm -hmm. So I've got all of that. I've said, I'm going to put this into an inventory table, the device tag, the host name tag, a space, and then the variables that we're um, storing like uptime, right? And it pushed it to influx. We're all good there. If we go back to influx, boom, here we are. The dashboards are showing those times for me. Um, now, what did it take to run that? And right now it's waiting to do a five minute poll cycle. So it took 13 seconds. Let's change this to take uh, four threads, right? And boom, learning, 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 collecting commands, boom. Look at that. It just, because it had more opportunity. So it took, it went from 13 seconds to 4.3 um, using threads. Now, this is also intelligent enough that next time, as long as I haven't stopped this process or it didn't abort like it did before, uh, as long as it's still running, it will never go learn the device prompts again, right? Um, it Because that takes time too, right? It takes time to go learn the prompts. But once we've learned them, um, we'll, we're just going to go the next time, you know, five minutes later here, we're just going to run it without... Um, those device prompts. Actually, I could just say, okay, for let's do a. Uh, um, uh, actually, I could remember how I uh, <laughs> remember the command. This is a nice thing when you when you write a project. Let's make sure that you put some help in there. Boom. Okay, so we have the P for the parameter file. We have F for frequency. So let's do a minus F. We'll do it every. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, so now it learned a device prompt because I stopped it and restarted it. Now it's in memory. It's part of a class of every device has a class entry that, okay, this is the prompt for that device. Um, and it ran the processing of the commands. Um, it's going to say here, it's going to start running again uh, in a few seconds. And then it won't run the discovery prompt. Why do we run the discovery process uh, for prompts? Because you can't assume dollar or hash mark is, you know, the prompt for every device out there. It's unfortunate, but the hash mark is actually part of the output of a show NTP association and show NTP status command. So if you use the hash mark, which is our pound prompt, which is very common, then it could be reading through that and it reads until and says, ah, I'm done. No, there's more output because this is an NTP output. So what, what we're doing here is we log into the device. 
and then we hit enter a few times just to see what prompt comes back and we store that. And now we have a more sophisticated prompt than just the dollar or the, the pound. It's probably going to have the device name in there, right? Right. Yeah. So anyway, cool things like that. Um, another, so this project is out there um, and I'll go back to my, my slide. So we say sharing is caring. <laughs> so we do links and uh, QR codes. So I've got three of them here. One of them is the DevNet dashboards converged availability monitor. This came out several years ago. Uh, DD Cam is the the big dashboard that shows thousands of devices being online or offline. It uses module modular capability to extract your devices out of um, DNA Center, out of ACI APIC controller. Um, out of VMware vCenter. And if you want to write modules for other things, we're working on NetBox and a few other things. Pull that information about what you've got deployed and discovered from your management tools into the authoritative list for availability monitoring. And then DDCAM um, puts that into like, here's, here's 2,000 access points and 600 switches that you need to ping the snot out of. And it does it in seconds because we're using an open source project called fping or fast ping we get that data back um in a json format <laughs> and then wrap some html around it and create a nice dashboard that says here's in red devices that are down uh, in orange devices that are dropping packets um in because we send like five packet pings to each one and if they're dropping any, we want to know about that. And then um, in yellow, uh, any devices that are above a threshold, like we set 10 millisecond threshold. So if something takes longer to reply than 10 milliseconds, then we want to know that the latent devices are out there. And then everything else is in green, right? So mm. DD camp's pretty cool. Um, SSH to influx that you just saw. Um, there's some example uh, YAML files that define uh, other type of collections. So we're using the open um, uh, uh, DevNet um, um, sandbox devices. So, you know, you can download it, clone it, and then use the sandbox devices just to get familiar with what it's doing. But then change the YAML file to use devices in your environment, and run the commands that you're interested in, and, and the, the capture groups and pattern matches that are necessary for for what you're interested in. Um, one I did yesterday was gathering uh, the show process CPU table and then including just the ones that were SSH process. So that was showing me how many, how many SSH sessions do I have logged into this device, right? Some of those sessions are gonna be my SSH to influx system occasionally going in and grabbing commands, but some of those sessions could be other people sitting there doing troubleshooting or configuration or whatever they're doing. And I might want to know how, how many sessions are being um, run and what's the process utilization for each of those, right? So um, so that's a good thing to, to note also in case somebody's just lingering out there. If you got some program, you know, maybe you got something going on crazy with Ansible. <laughs> you just want to know, hey, it's it's locked up a couple TTYs and it's really driving the CPU up. Um, I've got a, a sample um, YAML file in there uh, for that. Um, and then thirdly, I believe next week, hopefully, <laughs> I'm going to be releasing the Cisco Live Knock um, dashboards and collectors that you saw in the presentation. And uh, uh, some of the same ones for the Jerry Lewis telethon dashboard, the uh, the one that showed optical transceiver power levels, the wireless stuff. Um, we're putting those up uh, and w the code's done. Um, it's been reviewed. I'm just making sure that the installation documentation or the readme for the, the Git repo is is going to be good. So uh, so look forward to that in hopefully next week. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Thanks so much. And I pasted the links to the GitHub for everyone in the comments, in the chat. So if you want, uh, like Jason was saying, clone the repo, take them, uh, add features to them, adapt them to your environment, you're more than welcome to. So Jason, uh, sounds like uh, 
you'll have to become streaming telemetry guy now. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't know, gRPC guy? That might be it. A... gRPC guy, yeah, because streaming telemetry guy, I don't know if you're going to be able to get a license plate in North Carolina with <laughs> that long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got some pretty uh, long ones in California. I think they use a smaller font or something, but I, I do live in North Carolina. So. Yeah, I think they can only get like <laughs> seven characters in the license plate. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, any questions, folks? Very excited to uh, explore Cisco Denver Associates, Nag Raj. Well, yes. Uh, so, you know, these sessions that we do, these live streams, should help you kind of see where network automation is, what projects people are working on. And talking about other projects, there you go. Plug my book since uh, we saw Naj there saying he's getting his DevNet Associate journey. So, so uh, next step would be the Dev Core <laughs> right yep. exam. Jason wrote uh, is one of the co-authors of the Dev Core book. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, make sure you you study and and pass these uh, GitHub links. Rohit, I pasted them. Just a couple of messages above. They're all in there. All the GitHub links. And then Jason, mm. also you were talking, we were talking about, you're working on on actually a new project. Oh yes, thank you for letting me um, remember that. <laughs> so um, I, I mentioned how I was doing um, all this network monitoring kind of stuff. So let's, yep. let's jump back over. Um, another project I'm working on is called Cisco Metric Search Engine. Okay, hopefully you're seeing my screen. Uh, no, no. What did I not click correctly? All right. Click screen one, share. Sorry about that. All right. So now you're uh, there we go. Yes. Okay. So being a network management and operations and automation guy for so many years, one of the challenges I see at customers is what do I monitor? Like what metrics are embedded in in the in the Cisco equipment, right? You've got MIBs, you've got Yang models, you've got product APIs, you've got command line interface. So this project we have undertaken takes all four of those big data lakes of CLI show commands, SNMP MIBs, Yang models, and product APIs, and mashes it together into a way that you can then search for oh wireless client you know, six. Okay. So then it'll come back and say, here's some APIs from Meraki that would get you those client information. Well, what about in the Yang model? Okay. Well, in the Yang model, there's this wireless client opper. Um, and much like with Postman, you can get a code snippet that will uh, say, here's how you need to authenticate, create the header um, and the payload. Now we don't know how you want to use that information. So it's just a basic print at the end <laughs> that outputs that information. But here you can take that Postman like uh, code, whether it's code for the API, code for extracting a Yang model, like we're using NC client here. Um, and then a code, different code for doing SNMP polling, whether it's a get or a walk. Um, but yeah, this is something that we're releasing internally here very shortly and then externally for you folks, hopefully in another couple months or less. Um, and it will help you find some of that telemetry um, without, you know, doing a very nebulous Google search. This is very specifically oriented towards telemetry and instrumentation. We also have a, a capability in here that will um, prioritize some of the telemetry that we know that this is where you should go. It's not just a, you know, a bl blanket search. It's this kind of metric is something that you should use since you searched this way. So prioritizing it, we're, we're thinking about, you know, the cloud source uh, or, or crowdsource um, implications there, but yeah, CMSC, Cisco metric search engine. So is this going to be a Cisco product? Are people going to be able to download it and use it as an open source type of project? What, like, what do you see on that side? Yeah, so this is going to be one of the first tools that you see off of our Cisco developer site. So you go to de developer.cisco.com and you don't see a tools option right here, but we are working internally to release tools that you'll be able to use. Um, 
it doesn't make a lot of sense for this to be something you download and um, and install because it's all the same MIBs, Yang models, and APIs. Additionally, some of the CLI stuff you don't have uh, an easy access to, you know, crawling and and absorbing it. So it's going to be essentially a a search service off of uh, developer.cisco.com. Gotcha. But but when you select something and you generate a code for it, then you can copy it and then run that code in your environment to take advantage of the collection of whatever metric you're looking for. Um, additionally, one more thing that we're working on that's kind of kind of fun is how we might bring that into a um, uh, an ability to extend uh, the network into your environment. So we, we've shown how you can copy the code. We're also working on delivering that as a minor a, like a Docker container. So if there are dependencies and all that, it can be pretty much just download this um, this Docker file and then boom, you're off to the races. And then the third way that we're looking at is using something called RadKit, which is something that the TAC team uses to help connect with your network when they're troubleshooting. And it's very secure and you control all the permissions of what what's accessed. We don't have access to any of your credentials, but it allows us to run scripts in Cisco's environment through a pseudo VPN like capability to your environment without all the drama about setting up VPNs. Yeah. So interesting innovations. <laughs> yes. So there's a question just came in. Um, is any plan support for gRPC um, LinkedIn uh, user? Um, we definitely do support gRPC. I'm not sure the entire scope of the question, but um, part of that Cisco Live um, NOC US 23 repo that we posted a link in a QR code for does have suggested uh, gRPC subscription configuration for the edge routers that we do for our events. And if you make that configuration change, it'll push to an influx in the project that will show the dashboards that you you saw um, and there's some pretty cool dashboards in there i didn't show all of them we were going pretty long here um, one of those cool dashboards had like a 1990s um, led display for uh you know interface utilization looks like those old uh stereos with the you know spectrum meters on them and everything but it would show cp or, or interface utilization in a 1990s you know anyway and the dashboards are all in that GitHub repo, right? So people right. can can use them. Yeah, right there. We, we're posting the Grafana JSON file definitions. Um, so you just grab the the JSON of the dashboard you want. You insert it into your uh, Grafana. You may need to relink to your own um, Influx server, um, but it, it, it's it's not entirely rolled for you, but it's got the queries and the layouts and everything. Um, it's pretty close to getting you where you need to go. <laughs> Do you have any chance of Docker file for the influx uh, container in there too? There, there's a Docker file for the DDCAM project. Um, mm. I can think about the Docker for uh, SSH to influx and also the other one uh, that is actually identified in the project as a future action but i didn't want to keep you know it's been two months since cisco live i don't want to keep rolling the uh, the delivery of the the main git repo if people were comfortable with python scripts here's the python scripts here's the grafana um json dashboard definition files have at it and uh and we'll start to work into the the other aspects of doing uh, docker containers and making it more seamlessly installable cool 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 so i don't know if you had a look at uh, async io for your ssh to influx as a possible even better uh than threading option i use both actually oh you're async. using both okay async ssh at the lowest level async io and then threading all three of those um, technologies are used in some form to just really get the, inf the gotcha. work out there as fast as we can. Perfect. Yeah, it was just uh, a suggestion that I had, but uh, you already covered it. Yeah. Um, 
All right. So uh, I think we're top of the hour here. Any other questions before we wrap up the stream for today? Thank you so much, Jason, again, for taking the time. Love to have you. And, um, you know, once CMSE goes live, we'd love to have you back, uh, you know, demo CMSE for folks, how to use that. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you back. Cool. Love to be back then. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you, and uh, see you next week. As usual, be on the lookout for who the next uh, guest will be. As usual, on uh, LinkedIn, I'll send a message. We do have a, another uh, guest speaker lined up for next week. Stay tuned for who is it going to be. Surprise. <laughs> Jason, thanks. Take care. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone.